Welcome to Writer's Life, an ongoing conversation with writers, authors, and folks in the publishing industry. I'm your host, Marvel Harrison, Publishing Director, Members Press of Western New Mexico University. It is a pleasure to share a conversation today with Jennifer Jordan, an energetic, award-winning author, filmmaker, screenwriter, journalist, and so much more. Welcome to Writer's Life, Jennifer. Thank you, Marvel. It's so nice to see you again after all these years. I can't yes. believe years. You know, I I think of you as an adventurer, a voice of women, and above all else, a storyteller in so many mediums. And I'm wondering if you can just share with us a little about how you started telling stories. I started telling stories in the most basic way, which was as a journalist. And so the first stories I told were very cut and dried news stories. Um, I'd always been a journaler, but that's a different thing. So I'd always been, you know, had a finger in the creative aspect of writing. But my work was very journalistic. And uh, I was branching out from radio journalism to print journalism. And in the process of that, found a story that just blew my mind. And that was that at that point, and we're talking late 90s, that all the women who had climbed K2, the second highest mountain in the world, were dead. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what the hell is happening with this mountain? And why, why is it so much more difficult than Everest? Because it should be easier. It's only, you know, second is high. And why so deadly? And why to women in particular? So that really started my uh, my storytelling with with a just a fiery focus on women, on high altitude, on this place called the death zone that people go on vacation and spend tens of thousands of dollars to put themselves in this horrifically fatal place. So yeah, I mean, and for me in telling those women's stories, the women of K2, that became my first book, Savage Summit, I found that the research in combination with this, the aspect of making it a story, making it a narrative, making it almost a novelized version. I mean, it's very, it's, it's absolutely nonfiction, but just really working the story to bring the characters to life and their emotions to life and, and their, the drive that took them to this deadly place, one of the deadliest places on earth. And, uh, and why women are only 5% to this day of the Himalayan climbing population. So all these things combined in me as a woman and an athlete and a writer and a researcher. And, and from there, I kind of never looked back. Well, you know, Jennifer, I'm so glad you brought up um, the Savage Summit because that I read that book. Um, I think it was in the first six months of its publication and I heard you speak and your voice spoken wise is as powerful as your writing. And you I think of you in terms of writing as an investigative reporter, but you dig into the lives and hearts and souls of people. You know? Well, and I also, in fact, I'm thinking of it one, two, at least three projects in which I heard about the narrative. I heard about the narrative of a certain woman or a certain man or a certain circumstance and something in it didn't ring true for me. So that's where the investigative journalist came in. Okay. So I thought, I thought um, that, you know, this story might not have been told with as much fact as it would have been if it had been written by a journalist. So, you know, that got me into a whole nother aspect, as you say, of investigative journalism and of, uh, you know, narrative nonfiction and of diving into people's lives as they had been recorded by history, that all of which just um, also took me <laughs> in, in some wonderful and in some really challenging ways. Yeah. Well, that makes me think about, um, you know, your willingness to speak truth to power, your investigative reporting skills, 
expose the the many flaws, for example, of the 60 Minutes report on Greg Mortensen mm -hmm. with your documentary, 3,000 Cups of Tea. Uh, I mean, I was very akin to that story and was so taken back by how that was presented and with great relief was able to learn from you and from your husband Jeff's work about, you know, they just didn't really share the whole story. Oh, Marvel, I think it's worse than that. I think that they cherry picked the story in order to report it the way they did on 60 Minutes. And for me, I mean, I'm a, of an age that 60 Minutes was my model. It's one of the reasons I've wanted to become a journalist. That and Barbara Walters on the Today Show, because she was the first female host. I mean, that's how old I am. Mm -hmm. And I saw that 60 Minutes report. I knew it was coming. A friend called me, and I just, it was one of those moments in my life where I couldn't sit down. The anxiety level was so high. Watching this man and his mission destroyed in 20 minutes. Well, and, and it, there's one thing to say about how it destroyed Greg and his family and his legacy, but maybe even more gut-wrenching and heartbreaking is how it destroyed the opportunities that have been created. Yep. And, you know, I get that part about yep. starting a not-for-profit and it just exploding in, in goodness. Right. in a way that doesn't get properly you know managed in terms of every i dotted and t cross but man the the determination to destroy that and i don't heartbreaking it Absolutely is heartbreaking. and thank thank you for for you know risking telling that story um and i wish that i had been able to overcome the you know the fortress that i faced in the pushback from 60 Minutes, from CBS, and from John Krakauer, yeah. who, who uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm struggling with the, with the word of what he did with the story. You know, he he kind of pitched the story, as far as I understand, to Steve Croft at 60 Minutes, and it and you know his motivation. I'm asked all the time, well, why do you think he did this if it's not true? And I said, you've got to ask him because. He, you know, when I asked him, he threatened me and I, I don't know what makes one person want to destroy and not only destroy the man, but as you mentioned, the tens of thousands and over the years, hundreds of thousands of children who will never gain not only the education that Greg was providing, but the face of America, what really struck me in going to film 3000 Cups of Tea in Pakistan and Afghanistan with Greg was watching him go into a schoolyard and we went to maybe 30 schools in the limited time we had and watching him go child to child to child. And we'd all be like, come on, come on. We, you know, time's a wasting, Greg, you know, we've got a schedule. And he would go to every single child and we'd watch their little brown hands just disappear into his huge, because he's a very large man, just disappear into his hand as he shook every single child's hand, asked their name. And, and I thought, you know, none of these children are going to pick up arms against America because this is their face of America. This tall, gentle giant who is providing clean uniforms and a building, a school building with four plum walls and a tin roof that keeps the snow and the rain off and providing them with books and teachers. This, they, they will never look at America as the, well, they, who knows if they will now, but they were not on the path to jihad. They right. were on the path to peace. Right. And the fact that, you know, a few very ill-intentioned men can, could, take it to its knees and all but destroy it is is one of the the heartbreaks that I will have forever uh in my, in me it also speaks volumes to the power of what happens in the publishing industry yes you know in terms of whether something's appropriately evidenced or not whether something is 
told in a storyline with an underlying narrative that we don't know about on the surface. And, you know, I'm thinking a little bit about some of your more recent stories, the, the ghost writing you've done. Oh, and yeah. those stories, like, okay, so how does, how does one even find out about the story of the woman who, you know, ended up being, you know, I'm thinking of the perfect stranger. Mm -hmm. um, and how did, how did you end up in that, in that triad? <laughs> pure, pure luck, because uh, this is, her name is Roseanne Stoya, and she lost a leg in the Boston Marathon bombing in, back in 2013. And she, through her physical therapist, found an agent, a book agent. And she went to the, her brand new agent and said, I'm not a writer. I need to find a writer. And her agent, just by the luck of the draw, happened to be two doors down from my agent. So in their editorial meeting that next Tuesday or whatever, uh, Catherine said to Jill, my agent, I'm looking for a ghostwriter. And I had just called Jill to say, because the 3,000 cups of tea had almost bankrupted me and Jeff, because part of what Krakauer did was, you know, and I and I shouldn't I should put it out there as a possibility, but I certainly have sources that tell me it's true. Um, my my money dried up, my money dried up on a dime, and so I called Jill and I said I need a project. I mean the mortgage isn't going away, and she right. said, Well, I don't know if you'd be interested in ghostwriting, but this just came across my transom, and I said, Are you kidding me? A story about Boston, a story about <laughs> a strong woman, a story that will take me back to my roots. And that I will be able to just absorb myself into that's not about, you know, really the heartbreak that doing 3000 cups of tea was. So that became my first ghost project. And I love ghostwriting. In fact, right now I'm working on, on a project with another woman. So, well, I think that you do it so well because you have an ability, Jennifer, as a, a writer, more importantly, as a storyteller to actually get into somebody's skin. Mm. And it's a talent that is few and far between. And it means you need to leave your ego and life behind to, to lead their world well enough to be able to put their story on paper. Mm -hmm. And good for you doing that. Well, I think it's, I, I think it's the same reason that I became a journalist is a fascination with other people. Okay. And fascination with those stories. And so, you know, is it a gift? Is it a talent? Is it a skill? Is it a learned process? I mean, all the above, I suppose. But I really love getting into somebody else's life and head in a way that's so much more invasive than journalism, right? I mean, I'm getting in, they're telling me things and in fact, you know, all three projects and now four are telling me things that they know that they can trust me with that will never make the page but that I have to understand in order to understand their hurt, their process, their path that got them to write this story. And so the privilege that I'm granted to get inside those lives and to hear their voice clearly enough to get it on the page through my pen is for me just fodder it, it's just it's just catnip <laughs> you know as a psychologist and i've spent plenty of time in in rooms hearing people's stories i think about therapy being withness i mean there's a derivative of that definition and I think therapy is withness. And I think that's what you're doing. Not that you're intervening on a therapeutic process, but you're with people and you're not afraid of their vulnerability. So often we shut down someone else's vulnerability because of how it touches the pain filled wounds within ourselves. Hmm. And so you have the courage to go there. And, you well, and it, yeah, and it's often is not easy. I mean, yeah. in all three previous books, um, I did feel like a therapist at times. Yeah. Because I would have to ask very raw, very uh, telling questions. 
and, and, that's, and, and they would have to trust me in order to say, okay, well, this is why, and this is what happened. Right. Because if you can't understand the roots of what's gone on for somebody, you can't understand, or maybe even it's one thing to accept, you know, the outcomes of things, but to really be able to dig through and sort through mm -hmm. and weave together the story of how it came together for them. Mm -hmm. So what an honor for you to be in their worlds in that, in that way and in that depth. Honor and, and a gift as well, because, you know, I have, I have been able to help them get their story. And let's face it, no one's, you know, nobody wants to read Pollyanna's memoir. So their stories have pain, their stories have trauma, their stories have a vulnerability, as you said. And in order to navigate those very, very troubled waters, in order to produce a book that's engaging and readable and sometimes funny, sometimes painful, is for me, you know, part of the gift, part of the, like, you know, as a, you know, as writers know, when you get that perfect sentence, and hopefully there'll be several of them, and you know, scattered throughout the book, it's just, it's, it's one of life's rare joys. Well, I think of all of the remarkable transitions you've made in the world of stories, you know, journalism, uh, production work, film, screenwriting. I mean, you, you've sort of covered the gamut uh, from big time media. You were with NPR for a while, um, you, you know, to all sorts of maybe even what feels like an incidental story, but it isn't because it's someone's story. And what a gift you've brought to the to the written word. And that's the great thing about, you know, having a very talented agent and having an agent that knows how to pick and choose. I mean, I have pitched her things and she's like, sweetheart, you know, you may care about the story. And of course <laughs> that person does, but you're going to spend two or three years of your life on something that you might as well just, you know, you, your energy needs to be in, in to something that will reach a larger audience than your mother and her friends. And um, so finding those stories and then bringing them to life and bringing them to the page is indeed, uh, it's, it, it, it's a process, but it's one that certainly rewards me and, um, you know, keeps me always looking for the next project. Well, I think that your ability to step out on faith and try things comes from those deep roots of being an adventurer, being a, you know, an athletic woman who's willing to take risks physically, emotionally, I think spiritually, you know, it just is a big difference to step out on faith and um, embrace the possibilities of what's there. And, you know, good for your agent. I, I think one of the things in the publishing world that I'm recognizing is that having a product that people want to read beyond your mom and her friends right <laughs> does not lean into the absence of literary integrity mm -hmm. I, we can have both right and that doesn't mean you might not want to tell that story for your own process but that's not a story that needs to go into a book form for others yes indeed indeed <laughs> Choosing the books, choosing the projects is often as challenging as writing them. Ah, okay. And that's where you have aligned with an agent that you clearly trust. Well, and, and before the agent process, I am approached um, often, and, and I, I can't say every week, I can't say every month, but often by, by would-be uh, storytellers that, that want their stories told, that want me to investigate somebody else's story and write it. And unfortunately, nine times out of 10, those stories just, first of all, either they're not something that I want to spend two or three years of my life on because I need to be passionate about the story. Mm -hmm. I need to have a personal involvement in whatever aspect that, mm -hmm. that is. Um, and also it just... Unfortunately, a lot of people 
think their stories are more compelling than they are. I mean, we all have pain. We all have loss. We all have trauma. We all have had exciting encounters with exciting people, but that's not a book. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's often not even a magazine article. So, and that's a tough conversation to have with people who are just so, of course they are, you know, so filled with their own stories. And, you know, I've been told by everybody that I should write a book. And, you know, it's often my job to say, maybe, but I, I'm not your writer. Well, I think that's where I'm really pleased to see the number of um, workshops and mentoring available for people to write their memoirs. Mm -hmm. And I think that they are well honed in saying, this story is about you for you, and it might not be for anyone else. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to engage in that process in self-reflection, you know, here, here are the two here's the tool set to, to move forward. Yes, and I have, I love teaching and I love leading workshops um, on, on memoir and on uh, non-narrative, I mean, narrative nonfiction. Uh, but those are tough too, because people come to the table with their ego and they don't often wanna hear. Um, in fact, one, I've only had one writing teacher in my life and, I was able to audit a course at the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard when I worked there. And it, a, a woman led it who was a friend and now a dear friend. And she and I were talking about this just recently. And I said, you know, I remember that you brought me to tears with some of your criticism. And she said, well, number one, I knew you would take it. You, you could take it. And number two, you were the only student I can think of who actually took it and followed it. And it, it's like, what do you mean? Are, isn't everybody there to take it and follow it? She said, you'd be surprised, but no, they're not. And I learned that in my own workshops that, you know, for instance, a, a, a woman will come and just the, her, her paragraph, her first assignment paragraph will be two thirds adjectives. And I'll say, okay, well, here it is back to you. Now I want you to retell that scene without one adjective. Give me a little Hemingway, a little less, a little less, you know, uh, Faulkner, and a little more Hemingway. And she, I mean, it, it, and I suppose I didn't say it as gently as I could have, because I kind of watched her sit back and say, "Nope, I'm not going to hear that criticism. Nope, if she doesn't like my writing, she's not my teacher." I had a. Very interesting interview conversation not long ago with uh, an, a journalist, a writer, an author, Darcy Stanky, and she said, you know, the number one thing a person needs to be able to be a good writer is to be able to take criticism. Oh, yeah. And I think that... Like a good anything, right? A good anything. Mm -hmm, that's a good true. A good business person, a good mother, a good sister, a good daughter. I mean, <laughs> criticism, we're... I mean, if you can't take criticism, then how can you ever know how you're seen in the world? You know, Jennifer, I could go on and on with you because I so enjoy this conversation. It's been a joy to speak with you today. Well, let's do it again then. Okay. And thanks, Jennifer, and to everyone who has joined us. I'm Marvel Harrison, and from all of us at Members Press, May your day be sparked with curiosity and wonder. See you again on the next Writer's Life.